discharged from the Air Force. He was addicted to heroin. To support his habit, he staged the robbery of a local numbers house. And from that experience came El Dorado Red. It's the vicious story of crooks who get richer with the dollars of the ghetto poor. He's got it knocked. New cars, mellow women, and plenty of money. Then he learns that treachery falls at the feet of his own son. Hello, and welcome to Ralph Reed's. Brought to you by T-U-R-N, the United Ronin Networks here on YouTube. My name is Ralph Anthony Garcia, also known as R4. Please like, share, comment, and subscribe to the United Ronin Networks. We are Ronin. On this edition of Ralph Reads, I will tell the two final chapters of this miniseries, El Dorado Red, published in 1974 and written by the incomparable Donald Goins. Without further ado, to me or to you, let the reading commence. Chapter 12 Copperhead drove around aimlessly while he and Tank attempted to put the two hostages at ease. All you boys got to do, Tank said, smiling broadly at them, is relax, cause ain't nobody gonna hurt you. Now, Reno, all we want from you is a little information on your buddy, Danny. Reno held up his hand. Wait a minute, baby. Let's get a little understanding here. Me and Danny ain't buddies. We just do business together. That's all. Tell me something, Copperhead asked quietly. I know you've done seen Danny lately. How is he fixed for greenbacks? She it, Reno sneered. The cat was loaded, man. I mean, he was sure enough on full. The fact that Tank had put up his pistol gave Reno a feeling of well-being. He was sure now that all the two men wanted was information on Danny. If he told them what they wanted to know, he didn't have to worry about getting stuck up. He wasn't concerned about Carl telling anyone that he had snitched on Danny. Far from telling anyone anything about him, Carl had his own problems. Number one being the fact that he had been instrumental in putting Reno in the fix he was in. Reno, Copperhead began, glancing over his shoulder as he spoke to the man. You seem to be a big fellow, so ain't no sense in our wasting any of your time. Let's get down straight with each other. If you want some bread, man, we'll even toss you a few bucks. But what we want is Danny. His voice suddenly went up a notch. Not tomorrow, on the next day, but right now. Reno removed the hanky from his pocket and wiped the sweat off his brow. Even though the air conditioner was on, Reno had started to perspire. I don't know the address, Reno replied, deciding that he wanted to get this shit over with. But I can show you guys where Danny and his crowd hangs out, and that's the best I can do. He raised his hand, made a useless gesture, then continued. I don't like no part of this shit. I mean it. But since you guys are putting out the muscle, I'm caught in your net. He settled back in the car seat and gave directions. In another minute, they were parked in front of Tubby's house. Well, this is it, Reno stated as he attempted to get out of the car. All the studs you're looking for hang out in the rear of this pad. They fixed up the garage back there so that it looks like a real house. Tank hadn't moved when he attempted to move the seat, so Reno continued. Sometimes they have a bunch of bitches back there with them having big fun. Reno tried again. But Tank held firm. Look, man, what else you guys want from me? You asked me to show you where Danny stayed, so okay, this is it. I don't need a ride back to my car. I'll catch a fucking cab. Just let me out, this motherfucker. I don't want to know nothing about what happens between you cats and Danny. You know what I mean? It ain't none of my business, so let's leave it at that. Just let me out of this motherfucker. Reno's voice was higher than normal. Easy. Just take it easy, Tank said quietly as he removed his pistol and held it on the top of the seat so that the two men in the back could see it. Yeah, baby, Copperhead said softly. Don't break out in a panic now. We don't know if you bullshitted us or not, you know what I mean? How the fuck can we be sure that this is really Danny's fucking hangout? I mean, we got you, so it would be foolish of us to let you go right now without really checking out your story. Copperhead removed his pistol and held it lightly in his hand as he opened the car door and got out. 
Now all of us are going to take a short walk to the rear of this house and check on our boy Danny. If he's there or expected to show up, you guys can be on your way. Reno didn't like it. The kindness the two men were showing didn't fake him out at all. One look at either one of the gunmen's eyes was enough to warn any man with some common sense. Reno promised himself that he wouldn't wait for their permission to pull up. The first opportunity that presented itself would be taken advantage of. As the men piled out of the car, Tank made sure that there was no chance of either of the men trying to snatch his pistol from him. He stepped back out of the reach, holding his gun at the ready. The men walked around the side of the house, two abreast, with Copperhead and Tank bringing up the rear. None of the men spoke as they made their way slowly to the rear of the building. Before they reached the garage, Copperhead slipped around in front. He eased up to a window and peeped in. When he turned back and faced his partner, he was smiling. Reno, constantly on the alert for a chance to make his escape, moved around to the front of the car. When Copperhead turned away from the window, he made his move. He shot past Copperhead like a cannonball. He moved so fast that he took the two gunmen completely by surprise. Before Copperhead could react, Reno was past him and leaping for the top of the wire fence. It took Copperhead an instant to move, and then it was almost too late. He could have shot Reno easily as he struggled with the fence. For a brief second, Reno had to balance himself on top before finishing his leap. While Copperhead stood undecided as to whether or not he should fire at the fleeing man, Reno disappeared into the darkness of the alley. God damn it! Tank cursed loudly. The son of a bitch is getting away! Shut up, Copperhead ordered sharply. You want our little pigeons inside to get hip? He motioned towards the garage door. The occupants apparently hadn't heard the noise outside. Meanwhile, Carl stood motionless, afraid to run, yet frightened out of his mind by the thought of staying there with the gunmen. The sight of Reno running had almost spurred him on, especially after seeing that they weren't going to shoot. He had started to follow Reno, but he had hesitated too long. If by any chance you think you can make it to be my guest, Tank stated, reading Carl's mind. What for? Goddamn, man, you guys done promised me that I can go once you found Danny. Nah, Dunn kept my part of the bargain, so it's up to you to keep yours. Carl glanced from one man to the other. He really believed that they would let him go. For a moment, Copperhead started to let him go. Since Reno had escaped, it didn't really make that much difference anyway because one eyewitness was still alive. Copperhead stared at the younger man. He didn't want to kill unnecessarily, yet he didn't want to leave another man alive who could put him behind bars for the rest of his life. Seeing his partner's indecision, Tank took command. He walked over to the garage door. Keep up with our friend, he stated before raising his foot and kicking in the wooden door. Before the men inside the garage could react to the sudden commotion, Tank was inside the garage holding a pistol in his outstretched hand. He commanded them to remain still, but that was unnecessary. His sudden appearance was enough to keep the three men inside the building staring open-mouthed. Copperhead entered, pushing Carl in front of him and grinning broadly. Surprise, surprise. I bet you guys thought it was the man, didn't you? He said good-naturedly. He pushed the door closed with his foot. Now, don't you boys look so damn surprised. You must have expected somebody after taking all that money. You mean to say you didn't think one of the collectors would be around? Hmm? Really now, boys, when you play in the big leagues, you have to think big, too. I told you, I knew it was too good to believe, Tubby moaned loudly. Danny finally came out of the nod he was in long enough to see what was going on. We ain't took no money from nobody, he stated angrily. Who the fuck do you motherfuckers think you are kicking other people's doors down, talking about some fucking money? During this time, Samson was looking for an opportunity to make the break he knew they were going to need. He could feel the pistol pressing against his belt. Just give me one second, he prayed. There was no doubt in his mind why the men were there, and he knew they were there to do more. 
than just talk. Samson realized that he had been too slow. When Buddy first pulled up in the driveway with the blue Cadillac, he should have gotten rid of the fucking thing. He blamed the arrival of Copperhead and Tank on Buddy's appearance earlier that day with the late model car. As Samson searched frantically in his mind for a way out, he still couldn't keep his thoughts off Buddy. He was sure that it was all Buddy's fault that they were caught. He was so angry at Buddy that he couldn't think straight. What we gonna do? Tubby cried loudly as he began to shake uncontrollably. You guys are gonna come up with that money, first of all, Tank ordered sharply. Now where the fuck is it? When no one rushed to answer him, he grinned coldly. Now, if you boys want it rough, I believe I can fix you up. Tank walked over to Tubby because the man was crying. He had picked the fat man out to be the weak link in the chain. Using his long index finger, he poked Tubby in the stomach. Now, boy, I don't want to hurt you if I can get around it, he began. But if you make me, it's going to hurt you, fat boy. A hell of a lot worse than it's going to hurt me. You understand? Tank then plunged his fist deeply into Tubby's fat stomach. Tubby folded up like a wet balloon. Before he could sink to his knees, Tank caught Tubby under the armpits and held him up. Now maybe you can hear me a little better, friend, Tank stated softly as he held on to Tubby. Oh my god, Tubby cried as he regained his wind. He glanced at Samson, then turned away, ashamed to meet his friend's eyes. I can't speak for nobody else, man, but here's all the money I got in the world, Tubby moaned as he yanked a large roll of money out of his pocket. Take it! I don't want it! Just leave me alone! Tank took the large roll, glanced at it closely to make sure it was about the right amount, and then smiled brightly as he released Tubby. Now you boys had better pay attention to your smart friend here. He done saved himself a lot of trouble, not to mention pain. Say, my man, you guys don't need me no more, do you? Carl asked, creeping slowly towards the door. When Copperhead looked at him, Carl stopped his edging, but continued his begging. I done everything you guys asked me, so I think I'll be on my way. Nigga, if you take one more fucking step towards that door, I'm going to open your ass up like a ripe tomato. Copperhead stated coldly, Carl came to a halt immediately. Sweat broke out on his brow. Man, I ain't got nothing to do with this shit. Why don't you guys let me go, please? Shut that crying up, nigga, Tank ordered sharply. He had made up his mind on which man he'd make his next move and didn't want to be distracted. Without warning, Tank moved swiftly towards Danny and struck out the smaller man with a fist the size of a football. The blow took Danny by surprise. The next thing he knew, he was picking himself off the floor. He rubbed his jaw, wondering angrily if it was broken. Tank reached down and clutched the younger man by his collar and, with slow deliberation, slapped the younger man viciously across the face. Now, sonny boy, I can play at this game all motherfucking night if I have to, Tank warned sharply. So the best thing for you to do, daddy boy, is to empty out your pockets. Hey, man, what a big, bad motherfucker you are, Samson yelled sarcastically. I'll bet you don't even have no trouble beating up on old women and old men if they happen to be over 50 years old. Tank hesitated and glared at the husky young man. The sarcasm didn't escape him, and it hurt his pride. He realized at once what the younger man was trying to do, but it still left a rank taste in his mouth. Don't you worry none, strong man. I'll be over there to check you out personally, Tank threatened coldly. I just bet you will, muscles. Samson said, trying to get to the man. With your partner holding the gun on me, I know you'll just knock yourself out.
For a moment, the two men locked eyes, neither one wanting to be the first to look away. I just wish I would have run into you under different circumstances, boy, Samson added, glaring angrily. And if we had met under those different circumstances, punk, then what? Tank asked slowly. If that had been written in the cars, bully boy, I'd have had the pleasure, the pure pleasure of kicking the motherfucking shit out of you, Samson said, leaving no doubt in anyone's mind that he was sincere. The young man really believed he could take the huge man they call Tank. The sound of Copperhead's harsh laughter rang out. I believe Blood really thinks he could get out on you, Tank. There was a note of disbelief in Copperhead's voice. It was hard for him to imagine anyone in their right mind thinking that they could actually win out over the huge man. He lit a cigarette and examined Samson more carefully. Samson was a miniature tank, both men being built alike except that Samson didn't have tank's massive size. There was no doubt that the younger man was powerfully built, but he was at least 75 pounds lighter than the man he had so boldly challenged. Tank didn't miss the look of respect his partner gave Samson, and it only aroused his fury more. Without another word, he smashed his huge fist into Danny's face. God damn it, he snarled. I ain't gonna ask you again. Get that shit out your pocket. It didn't take any more punishment to get Danny to give up his money. He jerked two large rolls of money out of his pocket and tossed them onto the floor. Take it, he screamed. It's all there. There was no trace of the drugs in him now. He had become completely sober. As Tubby watched the procedure, he couldn't help but grin inwardly. He knew he had at least $1,500 stashed up at the house. When they had split up the money, he had taken a huge roll of the smaller bills and stashed them in his bedroom. Now he prayed that Samson wouldn't try and hold out, but just give up his share so that the gunman would get the hell out of there and leave them alone. Tank picked up Danny's money and stuck it in his suit coat pocket. Now, young blood, Tank said, turning to Samson, you and me can pick it around about your share of the money. I'm hoping you make me take it out of your pocket myself. Hey, this is swinging, Copperhead said as he walked over to the telephone. These young bloods really know how to do it. He picked up the receiver and dialed the number. What's happening, Rado Red? He said it to the receiver. You and the chick still swinging? El Dorado's voice came back to him sharp and clear. I know. God damn well. You ain't wake me up to inquire about my love life, brother. No, you're 100% correct about that, man. We done busted this thing wide open. So far, we've gotten back a little more than half the money, and as soon as we catch up with your son, buddy boy, we'll get the rest of the cash. The sound of Eldorado Red catching his breath made Copperhead smile. He figured it would jolt the old man, and he wished he had been there when he broke the news so that he could have seen Red's face. My son, you say... Eldorado asked, having known in the back of his mind that Buddy was involved. That's right, Red. Your boy. He was the leader of this shit. Before Red could say anything, Copperhead went on. Now, since we've gotten that covered, I'd like to know, have I got the green light with Buddy? Or do you want us to bring him back to your pad for your own personal action? Nah. Red seemed to let the word out. Just let him go. You say you got the other bread, so just keep that and let Buddy ride out with his. I don't want my son's blood on my hands, Copperhead. You understand? You leave him alone. It was an order, and as the full significance of the order penetrated his mind, Copperhead smiled. Before he could ask any other questions, the phone went dead. I guess from that, that our boss don't want to be disturbed anymore tonight, Tank. He said for us to wrap it up here, and it's finished. We ain't got to worry about Buddy Boy, wherever that punk might be. He gets to keep his share of the dough with no problems. Copperhead laughed. He sure is one lucky nigga, I can tell you that. Shit, Tank cursed as he walked over to Samson. 
That's money out of our pocket partner who was supposed to keep all the bread. So actually, it's our money the kid is running out with. When Copperhead laughed again, it was a cold, chilling sound. I hadn't thought about it like that, Tank. No, indeed. I really hadn't thought about it that way. And as you say, it really is our money, isn't it? He rubbed his chin thoughtfully. But on second thought, brother, we had better leave it alone. If the kid should show up before we leave, then it's something else. But if he don't, we ain't gonna go out of our way looking for him. While the two men talked, Samson started to inch his hand closer to the pistol in his belt. It would take just the right kind of break if he was to be lucky enough to take both the gunmen. And that's what he'd have to do if he wanted to stay alive. There could be no mistake when he made his move. It would have to be fast and deadly. But Carl made the first move. He had talked himself into believing that they wouldn't really shoot. He had witnessed Reno's escape, and they hadn't fired on him, so naturally, the same thing would take place in this case. Carl waited until Copperhead was almost completely turned around before making his break. In four quick steps, he was at the door, jerking it open. At the sound of his pounding feet, Copperhead whirled around. As Carl went through the door on the run, Copperhead brought his pistol up to bear on the fleeing man's back. The first shot hit him high in the back. The second one was just a little lower. Carl staggered from the impact, regained his balance, took two more steps, and fell on his face. He clutched at the bumper of the car. He held on tightly, but lost his strength and fell to the ground. He jerked once, and then it was over. During the commotion, Samson decided to make his move. As fast as his hand moved, tanks moved even faster. He slashed down on the younger man's wrist as he came up clutching the pistol. The gun fell to the floor. Before Samson could reach down and retrieve it, Tank followed his attack with a blow to the stomach. Samson let out a grunt of pain. It was all he could do to keep from folding up on the floor. As the two huge men struggled, Danny moved silently across the floor towards the gun. Tubby watched them as if they were actors on the stage. He was too frightened to move. The sight of Carl being shot down in cold blood had terrified him. Copperhead stood in the doorway, staring out at the body. He was undecided as to whether to pull the body back into the garage or just leave it in the driveway. He glanced back over his shoulder into the room just in time to see Danny reaching for the gun. Copperhead raised his pistol and shot Danny in the head. The sound of the shot caused Tank to stop. It took only a moment for him to see that everything was under control. Danny was dead, and Tubby stood shaking like a leaf, with tears running down his fat cheeks. Samson took advantage of the brief delay to get his wind back. When Tank turned around to finish the fight, he found a far different man waiting for him. This time, it was Samson's turn to take the big man by surprise. Faking a punch to the head, he buried his fist in Tank's stomach. Samson followed up with a blow to the head. He could feel the pain shoot through his arm. The punch he had thrown was hard enough to knock two men out, let alone one. But it hadn't phased the bigger man. Fear shot through him as Tank grunted, then grinned at him. I thought you was going to kill me, blood, Tank said softly as he moved in, bent over in the fighter's crotch. Tank's first love was fighting, and he was thrilled at the opportunity to engage in it. Samson watched the man move in on him. This was the first time in his life that he fought with a man and had doubts about the outcome. He knew that the outcome of this fight involved his life. They would never let him live. His only chance was to defeat Tank, then try and take the smaller man by surprise. Samson flinched, then delivered two quick blows to Tank's exposed chin. Neither punch slowed the man up. Moving with the speed of a lightweight, Samson danced back out of Tank's reach, then stepped in and fired a flurry of stinging punches to Tank's face. Blood began to flow from Tank's cut lip, and a small bump appeared over his right eye. With deadly control, Tank faked a blow to Samson's midsection, then came around with a swift right across the younger man's nose. Blood squirted like water out of a hose. 
Samson shook his head. From the pain, he realized that his nose had been broken. Terror was alien to him, but it overwhelmed him now. He was terrified by the thought of losing. That fear added to his strength. As Tank came wading in, he was met by a determined fighter. For the next few minutes, Samson stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with Tank. For every blow Tank threw at the younger man, he received three in return. Samson was everywhere, fighting with the blind power of desperation. Apprehension spread on Copperhead's features as he watched from the sidelines. He had never seen anybody stand up to Tank in this fashion. The blows Samson was landing were taking their toll. Blood ran from Tank's mouth and nose, and there was a cut over his eye. As Copperhead watched, the younger fighter stepped in and delivered four quick blows to his partner's exposed face. The punches caused Tank to stagger. Copperhead raised the gun in his hand, then decided against it and let it slip back to his side. Suddenly, Tank changed his style. Furious at himself for letting the young boy last so long, Tank took two more blows to the head as he waited for his opportunity. Finally, he caught Samson's arm, holding it by the wrist, and whirled around until his back was against Samson's chest. He held the arm out straight and turned it over so that the palm faced him. Using his forearm as a block, Tank broke Samson's arm quickly and expertly. The scream that burst from Samson was terrifying. In anguish, the horrified man glanced down and saw the white bone protruding through the skin. The fight was over. Experience had worn out over skill. Even though Samson had been the better boxer, it hadn't been enough to win him the fight. As Samson stood in a state of shock, Tank pulled out his pistol and clubbed the younger man down to his knees. The taste of blood running down his nose only aroused Tank's fury. He reversed the gun in his hand, pulling viciously on the boy's natural and snapping his head up. He waited until he was staring straight into the younger man's face, then raised the gun an inch away from that exposed face and pulled the trigger. The force of the shot ripped half of Samson's face off, killing him instantly. Before Tubby's shocked mind could absorb what had happened, Copperhead raised his gun and shot the quivering mass of fat. You're wasting your bullets shooting that fat bastard in the stomach, Tank observed as he walked over to Tubby's stretched out form. The fat man was still alive, holding his guts. At the approach of the other man, Tubby began to beg. Tank didn't waste any time. He leaned down and put the gun barrel against Tubby's temple and pulled the trigger. We better get the fuck out of here, Copperhead said as he walked over to Samson's body and removed a small roll of money from the dead man's pocket. Son of a bitch, is this all this bastard's got? We come out and lose an end with him. He searched further in the dead man's pockets until he came up with a car key with a tag on it. The word Cadillac was written on the tag. This is where this bastard's share of the money went. He bought a motherfucking Cadillac, Copperhead said, his anger apparent from the tone of his voice. Well, it's too late for tears now, Tank replied, taking one more quick glance around the room full of bodies. Let's leave these fucking guns here and get lost, he said, tossing his gun down after wiping it clean. That sounds good to me, Copperhead said, wiping his gun off. He tossed it down, then picked up the pistol Samson had carried. I think I'll take this boy's gun along. It ain't even been fired. He shifted the car keys in his hand, then walked towards the door. I'm going to take this boy's Cadillac and follow you over to Red's house so we can drop off his car. Tank stopped and looked at his partner. That's cool, man, but I don't see no reason for taking that boy's gun along. You don't know what he might have used it for. Here we get rid of our pieces because they too hot. Then you pick up a motherfucking piece that you don't nothing about. Tank shrugged his huge shoulders and walked on down the driveway. The back porch light was on, and he could see someone peering out of a window. 
He glanced back at his partner. I don't think you better cut the car lights on until you're halfway out the driveway. That way, bro, they might not see the kid in the driveway. The way the body was lying, it was impossible for the people in the house to see it because the car was blocking the view. Here, don't forget these, Copperhead said, removing the keys for the Eldorado from his pocket. He tossed them to Tank, then climbed into the blue Cadillac. By the time Tank had reached the street and got into the other car, Copperhead had backed out of the driveway. The two men hadn't gone a block before the people inside the house came out to see what the bundle lying in their driveway was. After finding the first body, they opened the garage door and saw the rest of it. Before Copperhead had reached Eldorado Red's house, police were running over each other looking for clues to the wholesale murders. A call went out for Powder Blue Cadillac. Chapter 13 when the two cars reached El Dorado Red's house, Tank pulled the long red Cadillac he was driving into the hallway and left it. He put the keys in the ashtray, then climbed out grinning. He was feeling good. The job was done, and it had been a clean hit. Except for Reno getting away, there was no one who could point the finger of guilt at them. They had gotten away cleanly. Clean except for that goddamn gun, he thought angrily. Son of a bitch, Tank cursed. He'd have to get right on Copperhead's ass and make him get rid of the motherfucker. Tank climbed into the passenger side of the blue caddy. Let's head up Main Street and dump this motherfucking car, he said as he settled down in the plush car. Copperhead grinned at him. Man, what the fuck are you sweating about? It's over. Beautifully done. I was thinking about driving this motherfucker out of the airport and leaving it. That way, we can save on the cab fare. Man, fuck that shit. If we were so concerned about saving, we could have used Red's car and left it at the airport. But not this baby. Hell no. Ain't no way I'm going to stay in this fucking ride that long. In fact, Copperhead, let's dump this motherfucker right now. Copperhead laughed. Come on now, baby. Let's not go to trembling. It's all over. Just sit back and relax. Enjoy life, Tank. Tank cursed. I don't fucking like it. This is too much like some dumb school kid's action, man. We done made our hit. Now we're riding around in the murdered man's car like a couple of fools. God damn it, Copperhead. This is the only thing that can tie us up with that job, man. So let's get the fuck out this cocksucker before it ends up costing our asses. Finally, Copperhead became serious. I was just bullshitting you, Tank. I want to get rid of this motherfucker, too. But ain't no sense I was getting out on one of these side streets. No telling how far we may have to walk before we can find the cab. Tank settled down for a second, then sat upright. Fuck it. I don't care how far I have to walk. Let me out. I'll meet you at the motherfucking airport. As Copperhead slowed down for a stop sign, he glanced over at his friend. You're really serious, ain't you? Before Tank could answer, both men spotted the black and white police car pull up to the intersection and stop. The police car waited until they had stopped, then pulled in front of them. What the fuck is going on? Tank said in surprise, then cursed. You still got that fucking gun on you, don't you? Copperhead pulled the gun out and kicked it under the seat. The three policemen got out of their car and advanced on them with drawn guns. Officers split up, with one coming to each side of the car. Put your hands on the dashboard. Don't either one of you move. The officer ordered in a voice that didn't leave room for any doubt. Now, I want you to come out of there real slow. The officer on Copperhead's side opened the door and held it. The third policeman stood at the rear of the car, holding a shotgun on them. Tank was ordered out the same way and brought around the car to stand beside Copperhead. May I ask, officer, Tank inquired, what the fuck's going on? We got a call on the blue Cadillac boy. It was supposed to have been used in the killing. Now, you wouldn't know anything about that, would you? The officer, holding the shotgun, asked. He watched Copperhead and Tank while his partner searched the car. Oh, boy! The cop searching the driver's side yelled as he came up clutching the pistol. Looks like we done struck oil. He removed the car keys and closed the car door. Tank glared at Copperhead. You 
dumb motherfucker, he mumbled. The policeman with the car keys walked to the rear and opened the trunk. Well, I'll be damned. Looks like we really hit the jackpot, the cop said as Buddy's arm flopped out of the trunk. Is he really dead? The other cop asked, looking over his partner's shoulder. He's as dead as he'll ever be. A bullet hole in his head. Why, I'd even bet money that we got the murder gun right here, he said, holding the gun out for all to see. Yes, sir, the cop said. We got the gun and the gunmen. Gunmen, hell, Tank exploded. I just met this guy. He was coming along and I thumbed him down. We don't even know each other's name, Tank continued, making sure he had Copperhead's eye. That was his story, and he'd go down with it. If there was a way out, he was the only one who stood a chance of walking. He hadn't touched a gun. His prints couldn't be found anywhere. One of the cops rushed back to the car, calling in for help. As Tank watched him, he mumbled to Copperhead. Old dude, it's been many a road we've been down together, but I can't help you walk down the time they're gonna give you. So don't take me along with you. Try to help me walk, and I'll do whatever I can to take care of business so well that you won't never need for no money while you're down. Copperhead glanced at his friend. Baby, I know what went down. If I can keep you out of it, you out of it. I don't need your company in the joint. I'd rather see you on the street. The two men's eyes met. They had an understanding, but it had never been tried like this before. This was the big one. When they knocked you out of the box on this one, you stayed out of the box. It's going to be rough, Tank stated, glad that the policeman had left them handcuffed standing beside the car. The officer who had found the body was still standing there, gaping, while the officer with the shotgun stood at the foot of the car, keeping the handcuffed men guarded. Let's cut out all the fucking yapping, the officer with the shotgun yelled at them. It was a waste of time. Both men knew that as long as they didn't run, he wouldn't hardly cut loose with the shatter gun. By the same token, he would stay away from them too. So they continued to whisper under their breath, You really gonna try and get out from under it with that hitchhiking shit, huh? Copperhead asked seriously. Why not, Tank replied, dead serious. They've got to prove it. I ain't left no prints nowhere near that motherfucker. Ain't no witnesses. Shit. Copperhead shaded sharply. You funnin' yourself, Tank. Ain't no shit that clean, man. By the time they put this ride back at that garage, them other bodies gonna come up. Still ain't no proof, Tank argued, shaking his head in anger. I ain't left nothing over there at that barn to point nothing in my direction. You're forgetting something real important, Tank, Copperhead stated. I don't want to knock the props from under you, boy, but face facts. That punk got away from us tonight. He's the key to the whole fucking thing. Tank raised his head and stared at Copperhead. I see you've been giving my chances a close going over. I like that. You and me see the same problem. Without that problem, I can walk. I'm serious, Copperhead. If that young nigga don't take the stand on me, I'm going out the front door. Copperhead looked away from Tank's eyes. He would try all that was in his power to help Tank out of it, but it was a damn long shot Tank was hoping for. I thought my partner told you boys to shut your fucking mouths! The officer, who had been in the seat with the body, stated as he came nearer. His partner, who had gone back to the car, came over too. His blonde mustache bristling as he hurried towards the group. He clutched his large 357 Magnum in his right hand. We better take real good care of these boys. They've been having a hell of a killing time all night. Detectives will be right pleased to see them. We even have to wait for another car to join us before we start escorting these gentlemen straight downtown. He informed his partners as he stopped a few feet from the car. Both of the men were already well subdued, with their hands cuffed behind their backs. There was not much they could do. Another car pulled up almost immediately after the policeman had spoken. The officers quickly herded the two men into the rear of the car. Then the three officers got in the front. The other police car fell in the rear. Then they started their quick trip. They were on the freeway in minutes. When they came off, the officer had made a right turn and they were at headquarters. Neither of the two men had spoken on the ride down, even when the policemen tried to draw them in on some friendly chatter about their whereabouts that night. 
Both men ignored the silly questioning by the uniformed officers. Both men knew what lay ahead. The days and nights of questioning. The friendly officer, then the one who threatened to use his fists. The hard iron cots until one got used to it. The waiting, the courtrooms, both of them had paid their dues in the courtrooms. In a way, they knew their way around the courtrooms as well as any lawyer. But Tank wasn't worried about the coming court fight. He wanted to make it easy by having no witnesses. His mind was busy on that problem. He regretted that he hadn't shot the boy in the back when he started to run. With a dead Reno, he knew they didn't have any kind of case against him. If he could bail out, he could handle it. Force the detective's hands before they had a chance to put it all together. If he could bail out, he'd take Reno out of the picture immediately. A dead witness was the best kind of witness. When the two police cars pulled in the garage, there were a dozen detectives standing around waiting. We are bringing in a big catch. All this attention, hell, who knows? It might even help us to get into one of them dress suits every day. I don't know if I'd want the job, the officer in the middle stated, lying smoothly. Each of the other policemen knew he was lying because each of them had told the same lie before. When the police cars came to a halt, Tank stared out the window at the welcoming committee. Damn, friend, Tank said as he twisted around in the seat. Looks like they really been looking for you. They been looking for both of you, one of the uniformed officers said as they began to get out. Now keep your mouth shut until somebody asks you to speak. I'm going to do just that, honky, Copperhead mumbled loudly as he got out of the car. Cameras exploded as the two men were led towards the waiting elevator. Tank turned his head as newspaper men tried to take their pictures. Go, goddammit, he growled like an angry beast as he was shoved through their ranks. Many of them stepped back from a sheer fear, strength, and a sense of danger was about that big man. People can sense the hidden anger that was inside that man. And anger it was. He knew now that he could never get out in time. His picture would be all over the city before people were out of bed. As he walked, his agile mind schemed. He didn't have but one chance now. He regretted that he would have to depend on another, but it couldn't be helped. He'd have to reach El Dorado Red. How long would it be before he was allowed to use the phone? Four well-armed detectives took them off the hands of the uniformed officers. The detectives crowded in the elevator. One of them began to read them their rights. As soon as he finished, Tank began his defense. I would like to use the telephone now. If all this shit you're reading is for real, I want to call my lawyer right this minute. Not tomorrow, not the next day, but now. Copperhead grinned as he listened to Tank. They wasn't going to get nothing but dumb nigger action out of Tank. He'd worry them from now on for the phone call. Copperhead reasoned, but what good would it do? Who would Tank want to call so bad? The thought kept worrying him until he came up with the answer. It had to be, he reasoned. El Dorado Red. El Dorado Red would have to come out of his penthouse and get down and dirty. Tank had the hammer of power over Red's head. If he didn't help Tank, Tank wouldn't help him. By that, he'd be letting Red know that his name would be mentioned. The detectives led them through the booking, something they never stooped to. They waited patiently while the men were printed, then were made to undress completely. Hey man, Tank called out, not speaking to any one detective. What's all this shit? What happened to all my rights? Where's the chance to have my lawyer next to me? He can't come unless I let him know I'm busted. And for what? I don't even know that yet. Tell him murder whenever you get a chance to speak to him. A tall, red-headed detective yelled back at him. Murder my ass, honky! Tank hurled at the man. You just take your murder and jam it. I'm gonna jam it, black boy, the detective snarled. Right up your black ass! That's the reason you're fucking around and won't let me reach the phone. Cause you know I'll bail out of this bullshit you guys are trying to build around somebody. Tank stated loudly, I got rights. He continued, I ain't gonna be railroaded. I'll just bet you ain't, the uniform officer said as he slowly printed them. The detectives stood around and waited. When he was finished, they were led towards the lockup. Hey man, what about that motherfucking phone call? 
Tank inquired as they were hustled towards the steel doors. If you guys fuck around and lock us up without allowing a phone call, you know it's fucking with our rights. He caught their attention with that one. The leader of the group hesitated then stated, Okay, each one of you will be given five minutes. Then he led the way to a room and pointed out a phone to them. One at a time, he stated. Tank almost ran to the phone. He noticed one of the detectives hurrying away. He made his call, dialing quickly. The sound of red came over the phone. Hey, baby, he stated quickly. This is Tank. We got knocked out of the box. Now, dig this. You had better see Reno. He's a young dealer on the east side. Drives a light blue 73 hog. You gotta talk to him. Seriously. If not, well, you know. We facing all day, red man, and I don't want to do life in prison, so you gotta take care of that business. The phone went dead in El Dorado's ear. He had got the message. Life was never even and without difficulties. If you didn't shake the boat, you were all right. But let some shit start to slide, and they will catch you in the landslide every time. Vera sat back in the king-sized bed and watched him. She sensed something wrong. Is it that bad, baby? She inquired after he hung up. It's bad, honey. I have to send a witness on a trip. He stated quietly. Oh, she said and rolled over in the bed. That shouldn't be all that difficult for you, should it? I don't think so, Vera, he said as he stared down at her, his mind far away. Yes, he could offer the boy money to run, but he'd always come back. It was serious. Tang never would have called him from the jail if it hadn't been. He had to protect the two men the best he could. Then, if something went wrong, they would know that he had tried and put some protection on him by remaining silent. Their conversation had been listened to. From the first moment they had spoken, Red had been sure detectives were on the other line. He had to move quick. Red walked out of the bedroom and picked up the telephone in the living room. Hello, John B. This is El Dorado Red, brother. Listen. I got work that has to be did before daylight. There's ten grand in it if it's handled right. Hey, Red, the voice answered quickly. I'm more than interested. There's a couple of boys here now that will be more than glad to go to work right now. Good then, Red answered, then began to speak. I want you to find a kid off the east side called Reno. He drives a blue caddy. Now, if he wasn't able to drive that caddy come daylight, I'd be real glad. If he wasn't able to ever drive it, I'd be overwhelmed with joy. But it's got to be soon. I got the message, Johnny B. answered. I'll see you in the morning about the bread, he answered and hung up. He nodded to the other two black men who had been sitting and listening. You boys heard? It's five grand involved if you're interested. Interested? One of the black men replied, shit, for five grand, I'd hit you, Johnny B. The men laughed. But Johnny B. knew the man spoke the truth. Five grand was a good price for a hit, and he still had five grand for himself. As El Dorado Red returned to the woman's arms who waited in bed for him, his money went to work. At the same time, the police department's best detectives were closing their meeting. What I want you men to do is to be sure to pick this Reno up as soon as possible before he ends up dead, the captain stated, and watched the men's faces to see if they really understood. Captain, a young detective asked, we have all heard the telephone conversation, but I just don't see blacks acting that fast. It would take highly organized people to pull off what you're expecting. Who do you think those were you brought in? Punks? Those men are professional killers. And whoever hired them to kill will have other connections also, the captain roared, as the detectives filed out of the office mumbling. Johnny B. and his friends were already in three different cars searching. They met on Mac an hour later. Johnny B. glanced at the two men as they walked into the restaurant. Mickey and High Pockets, both old niggas in their late thirties. Mickey was the first to speak as they climbed in the booth. I think I got hot shit. The dude we're searching for is a big dope man. I promised a bill to some dope fiends if they could locate his car. We can handle it from there. Johnny B stared at him coldly. You think it will jump off? He glanced at his watch. It's 4.30. They ain't got much time. He thought it over for a moment and added, he could be anywhere this time of morning. 
Maybe he in some hotel with a young bitch. You say he getting plenty money. He young, probably likes to fuck a lot. The three men ordered breakfast and ate it. Still, the phone on the back wall hadn't rung. Maybe we should ride some more ourselves, the tall, dark, high pocket stated. He was a quiet man with the face of a moose. Ride, Mickey repeated. Can we ride any harder than them dope fiends? They know his hangouts. We don't. I believe this thing will jump off. But we got to have patience, he warned sharply. The telephone rang before he was finished speaking. He jumped up and went to it, beating the waitress by two feet as Johnny B and High Pockets both twisted around and watched. When they saw their man relax against the wall and began talking, they smiled at each other. It seemed okay. Somebody was calling in about the hundred... Mickey talked for a while, then quickly hung up. He came back to the table. That's what we've been waiting for, he stated. Reno's over at Sporty's after hours place. If we move fast enough, we'll catch him there. He's strung out at the crap table, so he ain't leaving no time soon. The three men walked up to the cash register and paid their bill. It was just five o'clock. They had time. It took ten minutes to reach Sporty's after hours place. Though none of the men had been there, they believed they could get in. Mickey met the drug addict who had sold the information. He was young, just 18. Take me in, Mickey said before handing over the money. I want to make sure it's him. The junkie dragged his feet and moaned. That wasn't part of the deal, brother, he said, looking down at his shoes. How do I know this ain't no ripoff then, Mickey asked. The junkie glanced up. He realized he wasn't going to get the hundred that easy. I knew it was going to come up funny, he stated, but I know Reno's in there, so I'm going to take you in there. He nodded at an old car that held two more junkies. My friends know that he's in there too, so let's not start playing games. Mickey glanced over at the car. Man, I ain't trying to beat y'all out of shit. He flashed a hundred dollar bill. It's yours. All you got to do is produce. Show me the brother. And it's all yours. The junkie nodded and led the way down into the after hours club. Mickey followed patiently. He waited until the doorman opened the door for them and then stepped boldly in. The doorman hardly glanced at them. It was a neighborhood club crowded with youngsters. The crap game was going on on top of the pool table, which was almost in the middle of the place. The bar was full of young girls waiting for their men to quit gambling and come take them home. As they stepped to the end of the long horseshoe bar that went around the left wall, the young junkie pointed out the light-skinned gambler. There he is in the flesh, brother. Now, i like to see mine in green. Which one? Mickey asked. The light one with the big white hat? That's him. The junkie replied, now it's time I got along, brother. Mickey nodded, then reached in his pocket and handed over the money. He waited inside the place long enough to see that Reno wasn't with his bodyguards. He had a young brown-skinned girl with him that kept leaving the bar, going to the crap game, and trying to talk Reno into leaving. Finally, she put on her coat and walked towards the crap game. Mickey moved at once. This could be it. He hurried outside and waved to his friends. They moved around the blue Cadillac, making sure they were out of sight. As the minutes passed, Mickey wondered if he had a judge wrong. Maybe the nigga wouldn't leave. He might send the girl home in a taxi. He glanced at his watch. It was 5.30. In a little while, it would be daybreak. Suddenly, the door opened. Mickey could see that it wouldn't be hard at all. As he approached the car, the three men stepped out. The guns in their hands gave warning. The girl screamed, and Reno wished for the last time that he had his hands on a gun. It was over that quick. All three men fired. The girl dropped first before Reno did. But when they fell, Johnny B made sure they were dead. He walked over to both bodies and shot them in the head. The telephone rang in El Dorado Red's house. He shook the sleep out of his eyes and glanced at the clock. It was 6 a.m. He smiled as he picked up the receiver. Hey, Red, the voice came at him. I'll be by there to pick up my ten big ones. How about a little bit of... How about an hour from now? I'd like to have it, since that little problem of yours have been taken care of. Really? El Dorado exclaimed. He grinned down at the woman who had slept beside him. The going away money will be waiting on you, he stated casually, then hung up. Oh, I see you got that guy to take that trip after all, she inquired. El Dorado kissed her slowly. Yeah, honey, he decided it would be best if he went out to the east.
East Coast. He kissed her again, but his mind was far away. He knew that his dues had been paid once Tank heard about it. He knew that El Dorado Red had done all that he could. Now it was up to the white man's coat rooms. At least there wouldn't be a live witness against him, and that was half the battle. Six months later, Tank walked out of jail, free, while his partner went to prison for life. El Dorado Red met him outside the courtroom and gave him an envelope. It contained $10,000 and a plane ticket to New York. Tank smiled. He didn't mind. He knew that one day his phone would ring and Red would be on the line, needing some work done. This concludes this mini-series of El Dorado Red, written by Donald Goins, right here on Ralph Reads. I would like to thank you, queens and kings, fellow royalty, for stopping by. Kind folks, you may connect with me on Twitter and Instagram, as well as Periscope at RGMC2407. Drop me an email at RGMC2407 at gmail.com. If you would like to leave a small donation, please do so via paypal.me forward slash RGMC2407. Or the cash app. My cash tag is RGMC2407. We are Rome. You may also find me on my very own channel, RGMC Ralph Garcia, Master of Ceremonies, as well as right here at home on TURN, the United Ronin Networks. Fellow royalty, pick up a good book, read a good story, and set your good self free. I appreciate you and love you like cooked food. And I will see you on the next edition of Ralph Reed's Take Good Care of Yourselves. Yes, yes, y'all. Sure.